Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. Tonight, we begin a new book discussion. Tonight, we are going to talk about Volume 11 of the History of Middle-Earth, The War of the Jewels, or perhaps I should say tonight, we are going to begin talking about Volume 11 of the History of Middle-Earth, The War of the Jewels. So, um, that is uh, that is where we are starting tonight. So, we have... a. Uh, a lot of kind of reorientation. It's been a while since we've done the history of Middle Earth. Uh, we had a um, an apropos in a couple different ways. Uh, uh, interruption, of course. We finished Morgoth's Ring a while back now, a couple years ago, and uh, I think it was a couple years ago. It was a while. It was 2021, I think, is when we finished it. Um, and then instead of going back and doing the more of the jewels uh, in uh, in the fall, um, as the, that fall, so this was um, previously uh, the fall of uh, 21, I believe, is when we were scheduled originally to start the War of the Jewels. That's instead, that's when the Nature of Middle-Earth came out. And so I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about the Nature of Middle-Earth right after it came out. So we could all kind of read it for the first time together, which was uh, awesome. That was a great deal of fun. Um, and as I say, it was apropos in a couple different ways, because, of course, the material from the nature of Middle-earth is really taken from this same time period. You know, when Christopher Tolkien says in his foreword that he has, you know, uh, included, you know, almost all of the writings uh, on, you know, that Tolkien did on continuing the Silmarillion in the time after the Lord of the Rings, um, the nature of Middle Earth kind of fills in the almost, gives us um, the stuff that he didn't include. Uh, and of course, some of it we can understand why Christopher chose when he had to pick and choose. He couldn't include everything. And, uh, you know, I can understand why he didn't include the pages and pages and pages of um, tabulations and calculations of uh, elvish, you know, generational uh, time scales and things like that. But. Um, so I, I, not that I blame him for leaving that stuff out, but um, but certainly it was fascinating to see that. So coming back to the War of the Jewels now, the War of the Jewels is designed to be the companion work to Morgoth's Ring, which we talked about back in 2020. And of course, how he divided it. So, you know, he chose, he's, he remember that he said he was going to spend two volumes talking about this the development of the Silmarillion material after the composition of the Lord of the Rings. But instead of dividing the two volumes by time, like I said, dividing them chron chronologically, first giving us the whole first wave of material that Tolkien created, and then in this next volume, giving the second wave of material. Instead, he gave us all of it, but divided topically instead of chronologically. So he gave us all of the waves of material for the front half of the story. And, the, and now in the War of the Jewels, he's doing the rest of it. That is picking up the Silmarillion narrative at the crossing of the sea. You know, as he says, the, the, uh, the, 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 the sundering seas are, is what divides uh, Morgoth's ring from the War of the Jewels. And I think that, um, I think that this is a proper, uh, you know, it's an understandable way for him to approach that. Um, either way, I mean, I'm certainly familiar with this kind of choice. Like, there are pluses and minuses to doing it um, either either kind of way. But one of the things that this sort of leaves us, and especially, of course, in the situation with those of you who are doing, um, you know, this series in real time with me, is that it can make it a little bit harder to kind of hold the thread of what is going on with Tolkien and the Silmarillion, what is going on with his uh, discussion of, you know, with his, with the development of his work. So tonight, that's what we're going to focus on. Tonight, we're going to focus on kind of reorienting ourselves primarily with the assistance of Christopher Tolkien's forward. And I have to say, Christopher Tolkien's forward hit me very differently. Like his forward to the War of the Jewels hit me very differently than it would have done uh, before. Uh, you know, it, it, the, I, my thoughts on it are very different than what my thoughts would have been had we done the War of the Jewels in the fall of 2021 as originally planned. That is to say, 
uh, as I said at the time when we were talking about the nature of Middle Earth, I, I felt that the nature of Middle Earth, um, it's not that, you know there were it's not that there were a whole lot of particular texts like particular writings that were included in the nature of Middle Earth, which themselves individually blew my mind. There were a couple, but <clears throat> that wasn't, I mean, it's not like uh, there was nothing parallel to the experience, for instance, of reading the Athrobeth for the first time in Morgoth's Ring. Like, that was mind-blowing. There's nothing quite like that in the nature of Middle Earth. But the cumulative effect of seeing what he was doing and looking, as we discussed at the time, at the kind of patterns of his thinking that are revealed, you know, in the work that he was doing, including all of that long division, um, really has informed uh, my own views on this a lot. And I have, uh, as I say, I had some different reactions to reading Christopher's forward here. And I don't think, um, uh, I don't think that I, uh, I don't think I agree with Christopher Tolkien in his own analysis of what Tolkien's sort of state and plans were or would have been uh, at the time. Um, I, Jacob, I, the dancing bears were a little bit mind blowing. Um, not quite at the same level, but I agree. That was certainly one of the top five passages. No question. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, I will. Um, I'll mention, by the way, uh, for those of you who are here uh, live in our many of you in our Twitch chat. Um, also, for those of you who use our discord um, during Exploring the Lord of the Rings, I'm hoping to kind of transition towards using our discord more consistently for uh, uh, for Mythgard Academy as well. Um, so I have that open if you want to pop into there um, into our normal Tuesday night channel. I can see your comments there also. So um uh, we may uh, change that around a little bit. Um, one of the advantages, of course, is that if you if you if you are if you are in our um, Signum Discord server, uh, when you listen on the Lore Hall channel, there there's no delay. So on Twitch, you're hearing me at like a five second delay. Um, on uh, Discord, you're not. So anyway, just. Um, just thought I would point that out. Um, okay. Anyhow, so let us uh, let's jump into the well. Okay, before we jump into the forward, I forgot to do my now because got so excited talking about the War of the Jewels and uh, and uh, the history of the Silmarillion. I want to. Um, uh, I do want to. There are a couple important announcements that I want to make sure to tell people. So first. I want to let people know that my uh, my new book, Exploring the Lord of the Rings, Volume 1, uh, in which I'm going to be discussing the Lord of the Rings from the prologue through the flight to the Ford, um, is being released now. So this coming week, um, a week from today, uh, the first installment will drop for that. So there are going to be monthly installments. You'll be able to uh, so you can, if you would like to read it now, you could wait for two years if you'd like. It's probably going to take two years, maybe two and a half years. Um, and uh, uh, and if you, but so if you if you don't want to wait, uh, you can get the monthly installments right now um, and kind of be more of a part of the unfolding process of the book as it goes. Um, so. Um, uh, so yeah, so if you would like to do that, um, it's really cheap to get the monthly subscription. It's only two bucks a month uh, for to get the chapter installments as we go. Uh, and you can go to press.signumuniversity.org um, and look me up in the authors list there. Or you could go to blackberry.signumuniversity.org and go through uh, the Signum University Press section there and subscribe to uh, to my book there. So I wanted to make sure to bring that to your attention because I have been having a great deal of fun uh, working on this book. Really excited. The first chapter, um, so I'm going to, I've, I'm right, I've written three chapters on the prologue uh, to The Lord of the Rings. I didn't expect to write that much, but there was more there than I thought when I sat down with it. Um, and the first chapter that's going to drop next week is about what on earth is Tolkien doing? Like, how does he set up his readers to relate to the work? Um, what what posture does he take? Um, and why does he take this posture? Why does he pretend that hobbits are real and the 
his, and Middle Earth is like historical and like, what's he up to there? It's a, uh, it's a wild thing that he does. Why does he do it? Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's the thing that we're going to be, uh, that we're going to be talking, that I'm going to be talking about in my first chapter, uh, that drops next week. So, um, anyway, that's going to be, that's going to be a lot of fun. All right. So, oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention and this also you can find on BlackBerry. Go to blackberry.signumuniversity.org. And in our events page, enrollment is open for MythMoot, our, big, our biggest conference of the year, our four-day conference down in Washington, D.C. at the end of June. MythMoot 10, Homeward Bound is our theme. Um, that is open uh, for registration now, uh, as well as a couple regional moots. We've got Sunshine Moot. We've got Tex Moot. Um, Excellent, uh, Tallers. You're coming to Mythmoot. Very good. Very good. Excited to see you coming to your first, um, uh, to your first, to your first Mythmoot here. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so wanted to make sure that you guys knew about that because Mythmoot is awesome, and uh, I hope that you guys can be able, will, uh, will, will be able to come. Um, excellent. David Michael Roberts says I did a speed run through Morgoth's Ring recently, just in time. Fantastic. Exactly. Very well done. And yes, Tomas, uh, early bird pricing is still available uh, for Mythmoot. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, let us let us dig into Christopher's forward here. Okay. So we'll remember. Let's do let's start off actually before even we get into the text. Let's just start by a very brief review of the entire history of the world so far, kind of, more or less, right? Let's just remember the shape of to the, the, the basic shape. We're going to go through every detail, of course, but let's remember the basic shape of Tolkien's history with the Silmarillion, right? He begins, the first stuff that we have is the Book of Lost Tales. The Book of Lost Tales so his first impulse is to write a collection of stories. So he's been writing these elf stories, right? These, these elder days stories. And his first impulse is to put them together and to put them together within a frame, right? Within a historical frame, the frame of the human sailor, right? Who goes to Taleresia and meets the elves and hears the stories. And then we get all the stories and then he's going to bring it back uh, to the human world. And the human dude is originally called Ariol, E-R-I-O-L. And then he's like, no, it's going to be Alfwina, um, elf friend. Uh, and he's going to be, you know, from a, uh, you know, and, he, and, and Tolkien then begins to play with like situating Alfwina uh, in a more like historical place in English history, right? Um, and so you can see how the frame is really kind of beginning to grow. Ariel was kind of a standalone sort of uh, I don't want to say throwaway character. Um, that isn't quite right. But more sort of standalone, right? Where you can see with the Alfwina shift the frame story was beginning to develop and he'll come back to that impulse later on. Um, but anyway, so he doesn't finish the Book of Lost Tales, of course. Uh, it goes without saying that very few of the things that he did, uh, that he's going to be doing in this synopsis, will have ends <laughs> to them, will, will, will actually be brought to completion. Um, so, what he's, when he stops the Book of Lost Tales, um, in part for like the two of the reasons that he so frequently does stop um, uh, <laughs> writing things. A, because the thing he was writing was getting completely out of control, and B, remember his outlines for the Arendel story that he was going to do at the end of the Book of Lost Tales, which was going to be like three times as long as the entire Book of Lost Tales up to that point, right? Um, but um, anyway, so uh, so yeah, so it was getting completely out of control. Um, and also there were other things that he wanted to do. Like, you know, his, his attention was like being diverted and in particular, what he diverts his attentions to, as you will remember, and this is, um, we're now up to volume three of the history of middle earth, the lays of Beleriand. Um, he turns to epic poetry, uh, and he is, cause he really wants to do, uh, the alliterative, version of the children of Hurin. The Turin story was always really important to him. He had written early prose versions of it. One, the one version, which is just like an adaptation, a direct adaptation of the Kalevala. And then the sort of revised version where he's 
putting it more into his fictionalized world, which we see in the Book of Lost Tales. And he wants to develop that more. So we get the, the, the whole Children of Huron idea, and then, of course, the Lay of Lathian the Baron and Luthien story in rhyming couplets. So we got these two long narrative poems uh, that he was um, uh, that he was developing, right, during this time. And this is now, we're in like the 20s, basically. Then we have the sort of stroke of chance, right? And the chance that happened, what got him back into writing the longer narrative of the Silmarillion was the need, he was going to give somebody, give one of his colleagues, the children of Hurin to read. His colleague, who was not really interested, I mean, like, or it wasn't because his colleague was interested in his stories of the First Age that Tolkien was going to share it with him. Instead, he was sharing it with him because his colleague was interested in alliterative verse, right? And had been saying something like, oh, yes, it's a shame that alliterative verse died. You know, I'd, I, I doubt it could be really, you know, used effectively in modern English. And Tolkien is like, well, actually, I bet it could. Um, and, uh, and so he was going to show him his long narrative poem and alliterative verse to show him how, he, how, he, how he'd been doing it, how he'd been experimenting with that. But sharing this work with his friend, with his colleague, he was like, well, I can't exactly do it with no um, context whatsoever, right? I, uh, I, 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 need to, I need to write up a little synopsis, a little plot summary of the first stage because, of course, the story of Turin comes kind of at the end of it. And there's a lot of stuff that leads up to it and everything. So, um, uh, so yeah, so we're going to, I'm going to, so he starts with, uh, um, you know, his, uh, his synopsis of the mythology, right, as background. And, of course, he's Tolkien, so he gets carried away, right? Once he starts writing this synopsis, it starts expanding and expanding and becoming longer and longer. It's like 30 chapter um, synopsis. Um, and then he kind of gets into it. That is, he kind of gets into that mode of storytelling, the plot summary uh, genre, right? And he expands this out now. Um, and he expands it out. And this is so, this is, uh, it's 1928 uh, is, uh, is the first, when he writes that summary of the mythology. Um, and then it's in 1930 uh, that he goes back and he, he builds that out more and calls it the Quenta Noldorinwa. Um, and this is, so this is sort of the first version of what, you know, when most of us think of the Silmarillion, this is what we think of, the Quenta Silmarillion. That's, you know, like the whole big uh, sort of chapter by chapter summary of the story of the, uh, of the first age, um, you know, of the elder days. The Quentin Olderinwa is the first real version of that, right? So now at this time, he kind of, he still has fantasy. Now, keep in mind, I should have said, he'd had dreams of publishing this all along, right? I think it was clear that he wanted to publish the Book of Lost Tales. And again, I think that his giving up on that is one of the things that discouraged him, I think, perhaps from finishing it. So, you know, instead, he decided to give the British people what they want. N narrative poetry, right? Alliterative or rhyming couplets, narrative poetry, long form narrative poetry. That, that's surely that is what the British public demands, right? So that, so he turned himself to this obviously more lucrative turn. Um, I'm joking, but he did actually share the Lay of Lathian with the publisher um, and tried to get it published. But um, shockingly, no dice on that. Um, so when he's writing the Quentin Older Inwa, it's not obvious to me that he's really thinking in terms of like, I'm, I'm hoping this is going to get published and sell like hotcakes in the form that it's in. Right? I, I really don't think that he was thinking that he was enjoying um going back and revisiting his mythology, he seemed to really like this, again, that's sort of the plot summary mode, instead of just like diving deep and doing, you know, the stories in that, because the, 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 the Book of Lost Tales was very much sort of segmented, right? Here's this story, and then here's this story. And again, there was a frame to kind of connect them all together. Um, but instead, instead I want to write this kind of like a history book, right? I want to write this as if this were the historical records of that time, 
right? So let's uh, let's let's do it in that mode, and he seemed to really enjoy that. Um, now, <laughs> okay, then something exciting happens. Remember, 1930 is when he is doing this. And, of course, you'll remember what the exciting thing is that happens soon after 1930. And that is The Hobbit is accepted unexpectedly for publication. He's writing The Hobbit between 1930 and 1933. And then, unexpectedly to him, um, or unbeknownst to him, it gets submitted to a publisher and then gets accepted for publication. And so now he's prepping The Hobbit for publication. And um, that's kind of exciting. But the real excitement, of course, happens late in 1937 when The Hobbit is actually published in September of 1937 and actually has an audience. It's so popular. The uh, publisher did not seem to have very high expectations for it. They didn't print a massive run uh, of the first edition of the book. That's why Hobbit first editions are really hard to find, because the first edition of The Hobbit was a pretty limited run at the time. And then they were like, well, crap, we sold out. We need to print more quick. And it was hard. Um, so anyway, and there was a fire, like a whole bunch of them burned uh, and everything. So anyway, whatever the point is, there was all this frantic like, oh, wow, The Hobbit is really popular. And Tolkien at that point, remember, late in 1937, was like, my ship is coming in at last, right? Finally, all of these stories that I've been writing now for decades, Right, he'd been writing them for twenty years by this point. Um, so it had been twenty years since the book of Lost, since the, he started the book of Lost Tales. More than twenty years. Uh, and he's like, all these stories I've been writing. Now there's going to be a market because now I understand that there is a public out there who loves my book and wants more. And so I have a publisher coming to me saying, "Do you have anything else, Professor Tolkien, that we can publish?" And he was like, "Yes." Yes, I do. And so he began. And remember when we were looking at, I'm looking over at my bookshelf here, and we're looking at The Shaping of Middle-Earth and The Lost Road, Volumes 4 and 5, we were looking at the Silmarillion-related works that he was writing at that time. And it's pretty clear from the context, from what we could see of the, the way that he's titled things and the way that he's laid things out, that Tolkien was, at that point, late 1937, frantically preparing the Silmarillion stuff for publication. Like he, this was going to be it. He was going to be able to put all of this stuff together. And so he was imagining this. I don't know if he was imagining one volume. It probably would have had to be a series because there's a whole bunch of stuff um, where he was, you know, he, he had the Aino Indole. He had the um, the Quentin Older Inwa, which he'd already revised and retitled the Quentin Silmarillion. That was in 1937. He went through and was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta, I'm gonna dust off the Quentin Older Inwa. Um, oh, and he'd started writing some annals, the annals of, of Valinor and the annals uh, of Beleriand. Um, you know, because again, again, those two halves of the history of the Elder Days. Um, so, because those are kind of a supplement to the Quenta, uh, to the, 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 what was the Quentin Older Enwa and became the Quenta Silmarillion. Okay, so we've got the Quenta, we've got the Annals now. Awesome. Great. Oh, the Aino Lindale. We've got things like the Embarcanta, which is the description of the world and how it's made up. He had the Hlamas, the, the, the Tree of Tongues, uh, a, a description of the languages and how the languages developed over time. I mean, come on, talk about what the British public is demanding. Okay. Um, and uh, so anyway, so there's all these there's all these things. Um, and he was disappointed again. Right. The publisher was like, gee, this is really great. No, really. This is fascinating. Um, uh, but what we're hoping for is a sequel to The Hobbit, like another children's book starring Bilbo, The Further Adventures of Bilbo, um, The Hobbit, except more of it, right? Like, that's that's what we want. Not um, as, as nice as this material is, right? That's not what we want. And so, of course, that's when Tolkien then sets the Silmarillion stuff aside and goes back and starts writing The Lord of the Rings. Well, he didn't know he was starting to write Lord of the Rings, of course, but he starts writing the sequel to The Hobbit, which becomes The Lord of the Rings. Now, as you will remember, we get a brief return in the midst of all of this uh, stuff, because, of course, 
He can't even write the Lord of the Rings from one end to the next without pausing for a minute to, you know, invent a new language and therefore fill out the stories that is the stories uh, the story of uh, of 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 Numenor um, uh, that go along with his new language. Um, Adunayak, of course, is the new language in question. And uh, and so this is where we get the Notion Club papers and so and that 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 other Numenor material in which we can see this is the place where we can see him coming back to the whole Alfwina idea, even literally, of course, bringing the character of Alfwina and certainly the name again and again of Alfwina back. Um, but certainly this idea of the historical connection between his legends and um, uh, especially, uh, you know, English history, um, really sort of European history. Um, okay, so so yeah, he's um, he's doing he's doing all these things. He's 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 getting that together. But then he you know so he still doesn't finish the Notion Club papers and he sets that stuff aside, uh, and then he finishes the Lord of the Rings mercifully. Right, we all owe a great debt of gratitude to the fact that he finished the Lord of the Rings, which is so not to be taken for granted. Right, and then you may remember that he had a. Um, after the Lord of the Rings was finished, he went through a period of time where he had high hopes of getting the Silmarillion stuff published along with the Lord of the Rings. And he actually endangered the publication of the Lord of the Rings by trying to insist, um, like he was trying to use like the leverage of his completed manuscript, his completed million word manuscript, um, uh, to get them published together. And in the end, he had to drop it and just kind of go back to his old publisher hat in hand um, and hope that the publisher would just accept The Lord of the Rings and publish that um, so that he could have at least that, even if not the Silmarillion stuff. But during that time, during that time of negotiation, as soon as he finishes The Lord of the Rings, it's back to the Silmarillion material. And that time, like around 1950, so the Fellowship of the Ring doesn't actually come out until 1954, but by 1950, he, he finished writing in like 1949. Um, so 1950, he's done writing The Lord of the Rings, the long process of trying to figure out if and how and when he can get it published. But remember, that first wave of pushing it towards publication um, is fueled by this desire, this dream um, that he thinks, he believes at that point that he is close to, of getting the Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings published together. And then he has to abandon that idea. So when he returns to the Silmarillion, so then there's kind of another lull in the Silmarillion production. He produced a lot there in 1950, um, fueled by that hope. Then after he let the Silmarillion go again, he returns to the Elder Days and his to his legends of those stories in the late 50s, 57, 58, um, and, and early 60s. But at this point, this is now after The Lord of the Rings has been fully published, and he's now, you know, he's now uh, uh, moving towards retirement, right? Um, and the idea of the publication of The Silmarillion is less urgent to him, I think, is less kind of present to his mind um, as a drive, you know, um, like, I got to get this together so I can get it into publishable form and get it out there. Um, it seems to me to be less of an urgency by that time in the late 50s um, than it had been at almost any time in his life up until that point. Which is ironic, because, of course, by that time, by the end of the 50s, when The Lord of the Rings had come out and already been a global phenomenon... Now he could have published pretty much anything he wanted to. I mean, he had he put back together that 1937 pitch, right? And I, I bet you Alan and Unwin would have published it, right? Um, but ironically, now when it is theoretically possible, I believe, um, that, um, uh, that it um, would have, um, you know, been possible for him to publish The Silmarillion, he's no longer really kind of working with that same drive. But I think there's something else at work there, too. So this is where we're going to come back now and pick up uh, Christopher's forward here. All right, so uh, I hope that was not uh, too tedious a review, a sort of an overview um, of where uh, a sort of Tolkien, the history of Tolkien's relations with the Silmarillion there. Okay, 
Um, so here's Christopher talking about the first and second waves. This is again starting in 1950. I expressed the view in the foreword to Morgoth's Ring that despair of publication, at least in the form that he regarded as essential, i.e. the conjunction of the Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings in a single work, was the fundamental cause of the collapse of this new endeavor. That is, that energetic period of writing Silmarillion materials in 1950. And that this break destroyed all prospect that what may be called the older Silmarillion would ever be completed. In Morgoth's ring, I have documented the massive upheaval in the years that followed in his conception of the old myths, an upheaval that never issued in new and secure form. But we come now to the last epoch of the Elder Days, when the scene shifts to Middle-earth and the mythical element recedes. The High Elves return across the Great Sea to make war upon Morgoth. Dwarves and men come over the mountains into Beleriand, and bound up with this history of the movement of peoples, of the policies of kingdoms, of momentous battles and ruinous defeats, are the heroic tales of Baron One Hand and Turin Turimbar. Yet, in the War of the Jewels, the record is completed of all my father's further work on that history in the years following the publication of The Lord of the Rings. And even with all the labor that went into the elaboration of parts of the saga of Turin, it is obvious that this bears no comparison with his aims, or indeed his achievements, in the early 1950s. Okay, so remember that when he's talking about the early 1950s, like that first wave, what he... Uh, um, the new endeavor, as he called, uh, as he called it. Um, things that are included there. A lot of the work he did, um, like a big bunch of the children of Hurin, uh, comes from that time. Um, a lot of the stuff in Unfinished Tales comes from that time, um, especially the Elder Days stuff. So the unfinished Turin story, or sorry, the unfinished Two War Returns to Gondolin story that is published in Unfinished Tales, was written in this time. Um, the revision of the uh, annals, which we're going to get to tonight, almost certainly, the Grey Annals, um, is uh, that is um, also happening uh, uh, in this time. So he, he had written all this stuff, but notice what Tolkien, what, what Christopher is pointing to here. There's, there's this first wave. It's highly energetic work in 1950-51, which seems to have been fueled by this drive to publication. But as soon as he despaired that the Silmarillion would be published, or at least published, as Christopher says, in the form that he regarded as essential, that is, as a companion volume to The Lord of the Rings. He wanted them all to come out, you know... Kind of how he pictured it was, imagine if you had The Lord of the Rings, ideally like The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and then maybe all the tales of the Elder Days, right? Um, like translations, as if they were taken out of the Elvish. He probably could have squeezed it into three volumes, all of that material, right? And then to, uh, he wanted it, put all together, bound in, I don't know, maybe red leather and in a case, in like one single red leather case, that's pretty much what he was picturing. That's what he wanted uh, The Lord of the Rings to look like um, when, he, uh, when he published The Lord of the Rings. It, it, it needed to come all together, he felt, at that time. Um, and uh, by the way, I'm, I um, a, a section of the chapter I just wrote the the chapter that's going to be coming out next week of my book. Um, I, I talk about the references to the Red Book in the uh, notes on Shire Records and kind of talk about this the context of his relationship with the Silmarillion. Um, it's totally like he is he is totally. Um, <laughs> it's like uh, it's not exactly that there's a character in the Lord of the Rings that's a Mary Sue, right? But it's like, that is his own little personal wish fulfillment. Um, if he's uh, if he's kind of embedded himself into his narrative, it's like in that set of books. The Red Book of Westmarch is like his literary Mary Sue in the, uh, in the book. Um, okay, okay. Um, so, but then Christopher 
argues, and this seems to me totally sensible, I see no reason to question Christopher's uh, analysis here, that when Tolkien despaired of that publication, like the Red Book of Westmarch wasn't going to happen, right? People were just going to get the Lord of the Rings and they weren't going to get the Silmarillion along with it. That it really, he really ran out of steam. Um, on all of the Silmarillion work that he'd been doing so far. But it's not just a loss of momentum. Um, the gap between the early 50s and the late 50s, which is this gap between this first and second wave of working on the Silmarillion, also had, in addition to that kind of quantitative difference, it also had a significant qualitative difference. So if you remember your Morgoth's ring, and of course this stuff all came up during the Nature of Middle-earth discussion as well, um, you'll remember what he's talking about when, he's, when Christopher says here, I have documented in Morgoth's ring the massive upheaval in the years that followed, that is in the years after 1951, in his conception of the old myths. So you remember the massive upheaval? Um, the round world version, right? Which we were kind of, most of us, I think, agreed and disliking and kind of wishing he would just ditch and stick with the flat earth cosmology. Um, but this, this consistent desire to make the story, to connect the story even more firmly to our world, right? The rules of astronomy, the rules of physics, the rules of genetics, in, to the extent that he knew them. Um, uh, these things, oh, this is why we're, you know, this, this, this massive upheaval in thinking through, this is exactly why he ends up calculating um, how many years would it have actually taken for the elves to have developed from an initial population that woke up by Quivienne and into a host large enough to make up the great host in the migration that he envisioned, um, given the gestation rates uh, and birth rates and everything of elves, right? Um, that's the stuff. That's where his. That's where his mind was. That is post massive upheaval. That is exactly when he stopped thinking. Okay, this is going to be a sloppy thing to say, but roll with it when he stopped thinking purely mythically and began thinking much more concretely, began wanting to work out the details and make sure that it would work, make sure that people really could invest secondary belief in this, that it would not violate the framework that he was from the very beginning accepting as the framework of his stories, theoretically, that this is our world, right? Um... Okay, so, um, yeah, all right. So that's the, that's the massive, uh, uh, massive upheaval that he's talking about here. Um, and it affected all parts of the story. So again, the point is not just that he is writing with less urgency. He's thinking and writing very differently now. He's interested in different things now when he returns to it in the late 50s. Um, and that's why, so again, what Christopher says there at the bottom, yet in the War of the Jewels, the record is completed of all my father's further work. Uh, and even with all the labor that went into the elaboration of parts of the saga of Turin, it is obvious that it bears no comparison with his aims or indeed his achievements of the early 1950s. So he's pointing out two major differences there, right? Um, he did not achieve as much. That is to say, if you put together all of the, like finished, even, you know, not even counting, fin okay. okay, by finished, we don't necessarily even, make, like our standards as Tolkien readers are low. We don't need it to be, like, to come to a conclusion or anything. Finished in the sense of being an actual narrative that could get published even in fragmentary form. Um, so, like, for instance, tables of elf genealogical time, not counting <laughs> as a narrative, right? Um, he wasn't doing, he wasn't achieving, he didn't produce as much prose. He didn't produce as much presentable, or almost presentable, even if unfinished, presentable material 
in the later version. So his achievements were not as great. But notice he's pointing not just to the change in his achievements, but to the change in his aims. He was, he was interested in different things. There was a reason he spent so much time doing all that long division, doing all those calculations, right? All that multiplication and addition he was doing. Um, and that's because his aims were different. And as such, he was therefore, he was spending, who knows how much real time, right? How many hours of his time, how many weeks of his time he was spending doing calculations, the result of which was going to be what? A paragraph, a couple paragraphs, right? All of this world building that he was doing, pure world building, antecedent to actual storytelling. So he does much less storytelling <clears throat> and much more world building later on. So it wasn't just his achievements. It was also in this way, his aims. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, uh, Tollers, uh, 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 do I think the lack of revision on the um, Annals of Valinor is due in part to the real world uh, and allowing that to be more the mythic backdrop? I don't know. I am dubious because... Here's why I'm dubious. Because the mythic backdrop, the Amon stuff was in no way immune to... So like this, Christopher's... When Christopher talks about, um, but we have now come to the last epic of the Elder Days when the sh scene shifts to Middle-earth and the mythical element recedes, it would be possible to take that, to, ge to get from that sentence the impression that this new direction, this new kind of uh, focus, narrative focus of his work... Um, this new focus on world building correlates with shifting from the early high mythology material to the later, more romantic narrative, romance narrative, uh, uh, meaning romance, of course, in its medieval, not its modern sense. Um, st just like storytelling, um, rather than sort of high mythology. Um, anyway, it, it makes it sound like there might be a kind of a correlation there. I do not think so. Uh, again, because as we saw in the nature of Middle Earth, he spent how much time, how much paper calculating the very earliest and most mythic elements, right? Namely, the first awakening of the elves uh, and just the preparation. Um, you know, we need to know, like, when did the elves on the great march to the sea from Quivienen stop to have babies? And how many babies did they have? And when did those babies start to have babies? And was it still on the journey? Right. I mean, these are like, right. So um, he was very much. Um, uh, he was very much um, interested in f doing this kind of hardcore world building, um, even of those mythic elements. And it was one of the things that was most fascinating to me uh, when we were discussing the nature of Middle Earth, how you could see the sort of three elements, right, There was, uh, that he was kind of balancing. You've got the world building side, you've got the myth side, and then you've got the story side, like the, the, the overall narrative, the overall story. Um, a bunch of places, where, you know, where he, where he, and he was trying to do all three. He was trying to do all three, right? He didn't want to, he didn't want to have to change the primary narrative of the Elder Days, um, but he wanted to make it make it work, nuts and bolts, right? Um, really think through the world building in ways he hadn't done before, and yet to do both of those things without losing the mythic dimension of the stories. Did he ever achieve, uh, Everett asks, enough brand value to be able to publish anything he wanted? I think he had. I think that, I mean, look, um, Everett, I have a, I think we can prove that Tolkien had achieved enough brand value to be able to publish anything he wanted. I give you The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. So, um, hi, uh, you know, Rainer Unwin. My old auntie would like to see a volume of my miscellaneous comical poetry in publication. Would you mind putting that out? 
Yes, sir, Professor Tolkien, sir, we shall publish a random collection of your comic poetry. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think, and again, that I think is the the sort of the, the biggest irony, um, and in some ways the saddest irony, if you think about it from a particular perspective, um, of his whole publication history, is that at this time, the late 50s, when his aims and achievements are shifting, right? Are, are his achievements uh, in narrative writing and storytelling are diminishing, and his aims in uh, story planning and thinking are um, are altering, um, and becoming, in a sense, more unrealistic in terms of uh, the trajectory towards a completed product. That's the time when I do believe. I bet you, if he'd have, again, as I said before, if he'd have done his 1937 thing there, and he'd come to them and be like, okay, three volumes. I'm got, I've got, here's the Akalabeth, here's the Valaquenta, here's the Quenta Silmarillion, here's the Annals of Valinor and Beleriand, here's the Hlamas, the Tree of Tongues, you know, here's the Embarcanta. Um, slap the, those babies together in like three volumes and publish that sucker. I, 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 I mean, Rainer Unwin, Unwin would have done it. I am sure Rainer Unwin would have done that. Um, but, um, but it, it, um, it didn't. It didn't happen. Anyway, let's keep going. Okay, back to that new narrative impulse thing. For this, there can be no simple explanation, but it seems to me that an important element was the centrality that my father accorded to the story of Hurin and Morin and their children. So, sorry, the this, the pronoun at the beginning of this paragraph, is he's talking about why during this period he was spending so much time with the story of Hurin um, and Tur and Turin Turambar. Um, it's interesting how it's almost like Tolkien's life begins and ends with an obsession with the Turin Turambar story, right? I mean, Turin Turambar story is one of the biggest, most important stories of his whole early writings. Um, and then in the end, he's really focusing on it too. So why, why does he, why is he so obsessed with Turin? For this, there can be no simple explanation, but it seems to me that an important element was the centrality that my father accorded to the story of Hurin and Morwen and their children, Turin Turambar and Neonor Nino. This became for him, I believe, the dominant and absorbing story of the end of the Elder Days, in which complexity of motive and character, trapped in the mysterious workings of Morgoth's curse, sets it altogether apart. That saga went back to the foundations in went back to the foundations in the Book of Lost Tales. But its great elaboration belongs largely to the period after the publication of The Lord of the Rings. And in its later development, there entered an immediacy in the telling and a fullness in the recording of event and dialogue that must be described as a new narrative impulse in relation to the mode of the Quenta. It is as if the focus of the glass uh, by which the remote ages were viewed had been sharply changed. Okay, so what's he pointing to you? So on the one hand, so there are two things that I want to emphasize here that we see in this passage. One is just to acknowledge, and we'll come back to this when we look at uh, some of the later texts in the book, of course, um, when we're reading lots of Hurin and Turin stuff later on. But, um, so first is the importance of that story. Um, this came for him, became for him, I believe, the dominant and absorbing story of the end of the Elder Days. Um, I would emphasize that for a moment, of the end of the Elder Days. I've said many times before that the story of Turin Turambar seems to me the most mortal-focused of all of the stories in the Silmarillion. We have other stories in which humans play a part Baron and Luthien comes to mind, of course, as stories with prominent human characters. But even though, of course, mortality is a major issue in the story of Baron and Luthien, and so you could say it's kind of a, a mortal story, it's not really a mortal story. It's, it is a story which is interested in how the elves relate to mortals and mortality. That's, but the whole thing still comes from a basic elvish framework, right? We don't really enter into, I mean, honestly, and this is something, interestingly, we've been encountering uh, uh, in my Silmarillion film project uh, that we do on alternate Thursday evenings. Um, 
we're in season six of our planning of our theoretical uh, uh, TV adaptation of The Silmarillion, and we're in the Baron and Luthien season. And one of the things that we've confronted at many points um, is this sort of surprising extent to which, you know, Christopher can call that story, if he likes, as he did in the previous passage, the heroic tale of Baron One Hand. It's not the heroic tale of Baron One Hand. In fact, Baron is himself almost a minor character in the sense when you look at what he actually does and expresses. Um, it's not his story. It's not a story of his pers- It's not from his point of view, for sure. Um, and there are times in which it seems only barely interested in, like, what Baron is going through and what Baron is experiencing. We hear from him, so I don't want to overstate it, right? But um, the story of Baron and Luthien is really, and I think centrally interested in the elvish point of view on things. But the story of Turin Turinbar, that's a story which, from beginning to end, is really focused within the mortal framework. Um, and we get through the Turin Turimbar story more of a taste of like what it's like to be a human in that world, in the world of the Elder Days. Um, you know, whether you're Hurin being dragged before Morgoth or whether you're Turin growing up the way that he grew up and trying to establish his way and, um, you know, all the questionable decisions that he makes and the curse of Morgoth that's laid upon him and his family. Um, that is, um, uh, yeah, so I, I, I've long said that I, I feel that the story of Turin Turambar is the one which is really kind of submerging us in the viewpoint of mortals, or at the very least, in the elves' imagine. It's the elves immersing themselves in that viewpoint, right? It's not still not written by a human author, and a human author still might tell the story of Turin Turambar differently, right? Um, I think there might still possibly be an elf bias in uh, the story of Turin Turambar. Um, but that's actually going to be an interesting thing to see uh, as we move um, into some of the Turin and Hurin stuff in this book. But anyway, I really like Christopher's emphasis, not just on the mortality, um, but on the end of the Elder Days. It's not just, it is not merely, hey, let's check in with humans and see how mortals are getting along uh, in the Elder Days, right? As they're being trampled underfoot in the wars of, you know, elves and gods that are happening there in the Elder Days. Um, uh, it's not just that. It is the Elder Days themselves are passing, are preparing to pass, right? Um, and, you know, they're are things that we see and understand about that. And even the ways in which, like, is it, uh, are there ways in which we're being prepared for the concept of the dominion of men? What is the world going to look like when the elves are gone? I don't know. Anyway, um, it's interesting to think about in those terms. So anyway, so that's the one thing that I think Christopher says it's really interesting here. But that, in the context of our discussion tonight in this session, that's a little bit of a side note. The big thing I want to emphasize is the end of this passage. It's great elaboration. The, you know, the saga goes back to the foundations in the Book of Lost Tales. I mean, like, it's, that's been there from the beginning, right? And remember, it was one of the things that he was like, and now an epic poem, right? So, I mean, he has, there's been a lot of spotlight on the Turin story. So, but despite that, despite everything that he'd written about Turin so far, the greatest elaboration of this story. Elaboration, mind. Not just retelling, but development, building up, um, increase in detail, right? And of narrative form. Notice what Christopher Tolkien emphasizes. There entered an immediacy in the telling and a fullness in the recording of event and dialogue that must be described as a new narrative impulse. It's not just that he was telling more of the story and making it longer, he was telling it in a new way. It's a different kind of narrative. Um, 
especially when contrasted to the mode of the Quinta Silmarillion. That is to say, the mode of the uh, that plot summary genre that he kind of, you know, started to dig around 1928 to 1930 and kind of elaborated and um, supplemented with the annals. Um, it's a totally different, you know, it's, just, it's, it's as if the, the focus of the glass, right, the focus of the telescope um, by which the remote ages were viewed had been changed. Like, so you're going from zoomed out to zoomed in, right? And now all of a sudden we're getting this immediacy of telling and fullness of recording and dialogue. We're really there. We're hearing people talk. We're, we're a part of this world. We're being brought down very, very close to the ground um, as opposed to flying over at even at 3,000 feet, right, or 1,000 feet. We're, we're right down, right, in the middle of everything here in this story. Um, here's the thing that I would add to Christopher's analysis here. And again, this is one of the big things that I feel became really clear um, in reading The Nature of Middle-Earth. I think that this new... He's, I think Christopher's quite right about this new narrative impulse, but I think it's not just the Turin saga. Um, I think that is also what is the, um, the difference in his aims as he was saying at the end of the previous section. Um, that, I think, is the big difference. What changed in Tolkien's mind between 1950 and 1957? Um, sure, one of the things was he had given up on the immediate publication of The Lord of the Rings along, of the, of the Silmarillion along with The Lord of the Rings. Um, but his aims were different. He was writing, he wanted to write, and I, I, I think at the end of the day, um, I think that what we can see, the evidence that we see of what he's working on, again, especially the evidence we got in the nature of Middle-earth, I think he wanted to do, and I talked about this at that time, he wanted to do the Silmarillion in the style of the Lord of the Rings. Tolkien had never written a book like the Lord of the Rings before. That was new for him. He'd written lots of stories, but he had never really written a sustained narrative, a sustained sort of uh, historical romance. And again, I'm using the word romance in the medieval sense, which just means it's a, it's a, it's a story. It's not a, it's not a, you know, a, um, The difference, it's like a, so the, um, an epic is something that is designed to be like chanted and performed on a stage. Very performative. Um, you get dramatic speeches and everything, but you don't, um, it's not just kind of telling you everything that happened. You don't lose yourself in an epic. You're always, um, you don't get caught up in an epic. You can be caught up in an epic, but it's in a totally different way, right? You don't just lose yourself, as they say, in an epic. You don't um, invest the same kind of secondary belief in an epic. You don't feel like you're really there. You don't feel like you're part of the story. Um, you don't connect with it in the same way. You receive it, you hear it, but you don't connect with it. A romance is like a story from common life, right? I'm gonna tell you a story about people like you you know, like the hobbits in The Lord of the Rings. And you're going to get their story of what happened to them. And as they go and meet these amazing people and see these amazing things, you're going to be brought along with it, right? Um, and I think the evidence suggests that that's what he wanted. To, that's what he wanted for the Silmarillion. He wanted... A version of his story that was going to be like that, um, that was going to have that kind of immediacy. I agree with that word. Fullness. Yes. The immediacy and fullness in the recording of, of event and dialogue, I think that's what he wanted. I, I think that he loved The Lord of the Rings, not just the book, 
not just the story. He loved the experience. He'd never written a story like that. The Hobbit's a fairy tale. Not, it's not written like The Lord of the Rings. It doesn't have that same immersion. We're kept at a distance by the narrator figure, right? It's, I'm not, again, it's not a criticism. It's just a different experience. It's a different kind of story. The Silmarillion materials that he had written before, a very different kind of story, right? But here, this kind of immersive story where the world feels so real and the characters feel like you feel like you know them right and you 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 know that's the kind of ex the kind of immersive secondary belief experience you have with the story once he did that and of course started to really get into the kind of detailed world building that goes along with it that was not the kind of thing he was into before he never asked all of those questions he spent pages and pages and pages of paper answering with math uh, that we see in the nature of Middle-earth, he'd never asked those questions before. He would never needed to ask those questions before in the kind of story that he was writing. So, yes, it is as if the focus of the glass by which the remote ages were viewed had been sharply changed. He had zoomed in. And that's, I think, where he wanted to be and not just in the story of Turin. And so therefore, um, I'm not sure I agree with Christopher here. He says, it might be then that my father had no inclination to return to the Quintus Silmarillion and its characteristic mode until he had told on an ample scale and with the same immediacy as that of his sojourn in Brethil, the full tale, sorry for typos, I typed this myself, so there are lots of mistakes. The full tale of Hurin's tragic and destructive wanderings, and their aftermath also. For it is to be remembered that his bringing of the treasure of Nargothron to Doriath would lead to the slaying of Thingol by the dwarves, the sack of Minagroth, and all the train of events that issued in the attack of the Feanorians on Dior Thingol's heir in Doriath, and, at the last, to the destruction of the Havens of Syrian. If my father had done this, then out it might have come, I, then out of it might have come, I suppose, new chapters of the Quintus Omerillion, and a return to that quality in the older writing that I attempted to describe in my foreword to the Book of Lost Tales, the compendious or epitomizing form and manner of the Silmarillion, with its suggestion of ages and poetry of ages and suggestion of ages of poetry and lore behind it, strongly evokes a sense of untold ages, even in the telling of them. There is no narrative urgency, the pressure and fear of the immediate and unknown event. We do not actually see the Silmarils as we see the ring. Um, so, he, Christopher, concedes that it might be that my father had no inclination to return to the Quintus Silmarillion and its characteristic mode, that uh, that compendious or epitomizing form, what I call the plot summary genre, right? Um, it may be that he didn't, that he had no inclination to return to that, Christopher concedes, right? But notice this is until he had told. So Christopher seems to suggest that there seemed to be some desire. Notice how, again, he's still attaching that new narrative impulse, specifically to the Hurin and Turin story, right? It's like, I, maybe he just, maybe my father just needed to get the Hurin story out of his system, right? He really wanted to tell the story in that mode, right? Um, and maybe if he'd done that, then he would have gone on to tell the rest of those stories, the fall of Doriath and the, you know, destruction of the havens of Syrian and all the, you know, the whole end of the elder days there. Back in the old form. Maybe he would have gone back to Quintus Silmarillion style, having finished the story of Hurin and Turin specifically. I don't believe it for a minute. Not one minute. I think that all of the evidence of Tolkien's writings suggest that they get bigger, not smaller. Um... Here's exactly where I disagree. He said, uh, if he had done this, that is, if he had written the story of Hurin, then out of it might have come, I suppose, new chapters of the Quintus Silmarillion and a, ter and a return to that quality in the older writing. No, it wouldn't. I don't buy it. Not even a little bit. Had he written it, had he continued, 
certainly the entire rest of the story. The bringing of the treasure of Nargathron to Doriath, the slaying of Thingol by the dwarves, the sack of Menegroth, and all the train of events that issued in the attack of the Feanorians on Dior Thingol's heir in Doriath, and at the last, the destruction of the havens of Syrian, he would have done in the same new, following the new narrative impulse. I feel, I feel confident in that. Um, he'd gotten the bug for that. Um, and that's the direction that things are always going. They're always getting more detailed and closer in like that. Even the annals, as we saw in Morgoth's Ring, even the annals were tending to include more and more dialogue, which you shouldn't have in annals, right? I mean, you know, maybe, maybe you could be excused if you're writing a set of annals, like, okay, here's a my single entry for this year in order to summarize the important events of this year, right? Maybe if there was a particular, like, important speech that was made at some point, you might give an excerpt, maybe, right? But you're certainly not going to give dialogue back and forth in an annual entry. Like, it's just, it's not even, doesn't even fit the genre. And yet we saw... A time and again in the Annals of Amon that we were reading in Morgoth's Ring, how he gets drawn into the flow of the narrative and he starts writing dialogue, right? He starts getting into um, what was uh, his phrase, the immediacy. There, be there enters an immediacy in the telling and a fullness in the recording of event and dialogue that must be described as a, as a new narrative impulse, right? I think we see that even leaking into the annals themselves. Remember that the whole scene of Feanor being asked to give up the Silmarils and then what he's thinking and his refusal to do that, um, you know, after the, uh, the, the fall of Formanos is, is discovered, that was all an annals entry that got completely out of control, right? Um, that's the kind of thing that I think we... Um, we already were seeing, even in the annals earlier on. And I think that what it seems to me, again, based on what we can see of the stuff that he's writing, um, even though he's not producing as many stories, what he's doing is preparing the way for exactly this kind of the indulgence of this narrative impulse much, much more broadly. And I do not believe that new chapters of the Quintus Silmarillion and a return to that quality of the older writing would ever have happened. He's done. All the evidence, I think, suggests he is done with the plot summary genre uh, and is uh, all of his impulses are going uh, in the other direction. Um, remember, we saw this all the time. This is how he wrote The Lord of the Rings, right? You know, those plot outlines, which would often break into dialogue, right, as he begins to think it through and to imagine himself into those situations. Um, and that same impulse comes out more and more clearly, I think, in the Silmarillion stuff. Um, that seems to me the shift in aim um, that has happened between 1951 and 1957, primarily, and why he doesn't finish. Um, even things like the tour story, because he's doing that other thing he always did. He's going back to the beginning, right? Okay, okay. Now that I figured out how I want to approach it, the next logical step is start again. So, back to Quivian and we go. <laughs> and let's calculate Elvish growth rates. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. On now to the introduction to the Grey Annals. So we haven't gotten to the Annals yet, but uh, this is close. When my father turned again in 1950-51 to the matter of the Elder Days after the completion of the Lord of the Rings, he began new work on the Annals by taking up the AV2... So remember, um, the Annals of Valinor and the Annals of Beleriand um, were the ones that he wrote, and he had written two drafts of those. He started them early on in the early 30s, and then he came back to them. He did a, a revised versions, cleaning them up in 1937, hoping to get them published. 
Right. So that's AV1 and AV2, Annals of Valinor 1 and out Annals of Valinor 2, and Annals of Beleriand 1 and Annals of Beleriand 2. Right. So those he finished some 15 years later, that is in 1937. And use, so he, he took those two manuscripts, the 1937 manuscripts that the publisher didn't want. Right. He takes those and he uses those as vehicles for revision and new writing. In the Annals of Beleriand 2, on the other hand, the preparatory stages were much more extensive and extensive and substantial. In the first place, the revision of the original um, Annals of Beleriand II text continues much further, although in practice this can be largely passed over, since the content of the revision appears in subsequent texts. In the second place, the beginning of a new and much fuller version of the Annals of Beleriand on the blank verso pages of AB2 extends for a considerable distance, 13 manuscript pages, and the first part of this is written in such a careful script before it begins to degenerate that it may be thought that my father did not at first intend it as a draft. It is entitled The Annals of Beleriand and could on that account be referred to as AB3, but I shall in fact call it GA1, Grey Annals, a manuscript one. Okay. The careful script is an important cue. Um, of course, uh, you will remember over the course of the history of, uh, the, nat of, of you know, the history of Middle Earth um, that we have seen and talked about Tolkien's handwriting many times. Tolkien's handwriting is of mostly two different kinds, right? Um, it is either gorgeous or practically illegible. Um, and it seems pretty clear why he does the one and why he does the other, right? The nearly illegible version is when he's just writing for himself, notes for himself, a quick draft for himself. It's clearly designed just to write at speed as he's trying to get things out on the page, right? Um, but when he writes fancy, which he was capable of extremely fancy writing, right? When he writes fancy, when he writes in a careful script, it tends to be... Um, yeah, uh, Matt says, I like when he writes in Tengwar. It's almost always legible. Yes. Um, he does much less scrolling in Tengwar. Um, but, um, anyway, when he's writing in a careful script, when he's writing very legibly, it seems to me to be generally because he, and this seems like a super obvious thing to say, but he's intending somebody else to read it, right? That is when he is, um, when he is writing a fair copy, something that he might hand in to somebody or at least give to somebody else to read. In other words, it seems to me that the evidence of his careful script, this writing of 13 manuscript pages of careful script, which is basically like an updating of the last. So he takes the 1937 Annals of Beleriand and he's like, okay, I want to do, I want to, I want to, I'm, I'm just going to revise this, but I'm not rewriting it. Right. That's what Christopher means when he says he didn't intend it to be a draft. Right. He didn't think of when he sat down to that work, he didn't think of this as like, OK, time to uh, start again. Right. Time to uh, uh, reinvent the annals of Beleriand. I'm going to start with a new draft. He didn't think he was starting with a new draft. He thought he was just doing a fair copy of a slightly revised version. I've got it. So I'm just going to remember it's 1950 publication of the Silmarillion is nigh, right? The Red Book of West March is on the table still in his own mind, right? So I'm going to take the Annals of Beleriand that I've got and I'm going to rework them, but I'm going to rework them in, in nice handwriting, right? So that this is a version I could send to, you know, Rainer Unwin and have him have him look at this, right? Um, that seems to be how he began, this rewriting of the Annals of Beleriand. But guess what happened along the way? Along the way, he starts changing it, right? And it becomes, eventually, he abandons the fancy script and starts making it a draft, starts writing sloppy again as he realizes 
no, okay, this isn't going to be the fair copy. I'm making, I'm, I'm, you know, new story is coming. So let's let's roll with the new story here, right? So that's one thing that we see. The the gray annals that we're going to read begin as fair copy, you know, begin as uh, like a. I'm just going to dress up what I've got, right? Uh, and uh, in order to put it out there, but it becomes it morphs into something else as tended to happen when Tolkien was doing this kind of thing. But um, here's one of the things that I love. Okay, more. There is some evidence that the Grey Annals followed the Annals of Amon in its primary form. Remember, the Annals of, Annals of Amon we got in Morgoth's Ring. So he had the Annals of Alinor and the Annals of Beleriand. He revises both of them and he changes the title of both of them. The Annals of Valinor become the Annals of Amon, and the Annals of Beleriand become the Grey Annals. Okay, so same process. So the Grey Annals are parallel to the Annals of Amon, which we got in the previous version. It was the Annals of Amon, as I recall, where we got the, the example that I just cited of, um, uh, of getting carried away, telling the Fanor, not breaking the jewels story, right? That was the Annals of Amon, the later version of this that he was doing in 1950. Okay, there's some evidence that the Grey Annals follow. So, you know, he, he did them both, the Annals of Amon and the Grey Annals, in this 1950 to 51. But, like, which one did he do first? And so that's where Christopher is saying there's some evidence that he did the Annals of Amon first. But the two works were, I feel certain, closely associated in time of composition. For the structure of the history of Beleriand, the Grey Annals constitutes the primary text, and although much of the latter part of the work was used in the published Silmarillion with little change, I give it in full. This is really essential on practical grounds, but it is also in keeping with my intention in this history, in which I have traced the development of the matter of the Elder Days from its beginning to its end within the compass of my father's actual writings. From this point of view, the published works is not its end, and I do not treat the, his later writing primarily in relation to what was used, or how it was used, in the Silmarillion. It is a most unhappy fact that he abandoned the Grey Annals at the death of Turin, although, as will be seen subsequently, he added elements of a continuation at some later time. Okay. Um, so, all right, so the Grey Annals only go up to the death of Turin. Um, he, Christopher, notes that many passages of the published Silmarillion are taken word for word from the Grey Annals rather than from revisions. Even though, like, so that section of the published Silmarillion that is called the Quintus Silmarillion is actually comprised of some bits from the Quintus Silmarillion and some bits from the Annals of Amon and from the Grey Annals, which are lifted straight out of there and integrated with the other text, right? You will recall that we saw a bunch of examples of this in uh, the Annals of Amon uh, when we were reading Morgoth's Ring. Um, Christopher is... Uh, so I like Christopher's uh, sort of... Um, I don't know if it counts as a warning exactly, but his note here that he's not going to waste his time trying to either explain or justify how everything got into the Silmarillion. He's like, the goal of this book of this series of books is not just to um, explain, you know, his father's writing primarily in relation to what was used or how in the Silmarillion. This is not just like a commentary on the published Silmarillion. What he's trying to do is like irrespective of what and how things got put together in the published Silmarillion. I want to show you the whole thing and how it all fits in together. And of course, from that, we might gain an understanding as to the choices that the editorial choices that Christopher made. He's showing us all of his raw materials, right, from which he drew the published Silmarillion. Um, and um, I, so I admire the fact that Christopher, it's a very humble move for Christopher. Um, it would have been really tempting, I'm sure, uh, for Christopher to kind of let this slide into a, you know, self-justification, essentially. Like, to, he poured so much of himself, Christopher poured so much of himself into putting together the published Silmarillion that I would have understood 
had he wanted to write a whole volume in which he was like, so let me tell you, let me show you how I did this. Let me let, let me break it down for you and tell you what I and why I made this choice and why I made that choice and all of this, all of this kind of thing. Um, uh, but he says, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to walk you through that step by step. Basically, I think he's saying, like, you can figure it out. You can put it together. If, you, if you're interested in this question, I'm giving you pretty much all you need in order to be able to see, um, uh, you know, what uh, how the published Sil Silmarillion was made. But I'm not going to I'm not going to back it up. And of course, it's I didn't include that in this passage, um, but it's right near this paragraph um, where he talks about um, some of his own regrets that there are some of the decisions, some of the editorial decisions that he made in producing the published Silmarillion, which he very much regrets. Um, so I think we'll see some of those things, too, uh, as we go through this book, just as we saw one or two of them uh, in Morgoth's Ring as well. Um, but a side note from this. This helps explain some of the some of the irregularities of the published Silmarillion. That is, what he is pointing to, and again, he's not going to spell it out, you know, map it out passage by passage for us, but what he's pointing to here is that the stories that we get in the published Silmarillion, like the chapters of the Quenta Silmarillion in the published Silmarillion, sound like unified stories, but they're not. Right? Like the, um, you know, the, you look at the, uh, you know, so I got my published Silmarillion here, right? And you look at the chapters like of the flight of the Noldor, of the return of the Noldor, right? Of the ruin of Beleriand, right? All of these chapters here, none, like, very few of those, if you take the chapter as a document, that's not a document that Tolkien wrote. That these chapters are composite documents with material that is drawn from the annals, material that is drawn from the Quinta, and sometimes material that's drawn from other places as well. And this, I think, helps to explain. I think about the um, uh, um I think that's um remember when you talked about the 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 glass right the telescope um it is as if the focus of the glass by which the remote ages were viewed had been sharply changed um I think that this helps to explain I remember having conversations about this many 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 years ago back in the Silmarillion seminar when we were talking about, we were going through the published Silmarillion chapter by chapter and um, we were talking about places where the narrative zooms out and in. Right? I think that was the metaphor that we were using when we were talking about that there and I think we've, we've talked about this at some points in our discussion of the histories as well. Um, but now I think we can begin to see why that is and why that happens. Right? that sometimes this zooming, it's the later impulse. This is happening, this shift from this really, really high, we're looking at the whole thing from 20,000 feet narrative to all of a sudden now we're getting dialogue, right? And we're hearing what people are thinking and stuff. Um, results in part from Christopher taking, making into, making one composite narrative, not only out of multiple texts, but of different texts that are written at different times with different narrative aims by Tolkien as well. So when we get a chapter which contains some of his, you know, 1950s impulses and some of his 1930 impulses, right? Um, and those are going to be different, very different. Um, All right. This is my favorite bit. At the top of the first page of the old AB2 text, Annals of Beleriand 2 text, 
no doubt before he began work on the enormously enlarged new version. My father scribbled these notes. Make these the Cinderin Annals of Doriath, and leave out most of the... There are here two words that probably read Noldoran stuff. And put in notes about Denethor, Thingol, etc. from A.V. That is the Annals of Valinor. I believe this to be tremendously important. Tremendously important. Um, and the shift from Annals of Beleriand to the Grey Annals is not just because he thought the Grey Annals was a snappier title. It is rather a reflection, it seems to me, of an entirely new, even a radically new conceptualization of this text. Do you see the difference? It's phenomenal. It's the difference between a distant narrative written from an indeterminate point of view. I mean, he started the annals, as Christopher mentioned in a passage I didn't quote. He started the annals, it seems, as a way to just kind of keep his own head straight. Right? Um, so it was, it was going to be, he was doing the Quintus Silmarillion, but he wanted to make sure that he didn't screw up the chronology. So he starts mapping out the chronology for himself. But then that gets kind of addictive, right? And each entry starts getting fatter and fatter like they do, right? Um, until by 1937, the Annals and the Quenta had become these two parallel texts, which were slightly different in their kind of emphasis, but they were still both of them distant. Um, they didn't have a clear frame. You couldn't really sit down and say, okay, who wrote that? Whose perspective is this from? But now, now he has that. Now he's decided, okay, the Annals of Beleriand, this is going to be a Sindarin task, text. This is going to be written from the Sindarin point of view. That is a huge difference. So um, leave out the Noldoran stuff. We're going to write a version of the, la of the latter half of the Elder Days with all the Noldoran stuff removed? Really? Okay. I'm here for it. <laughs> I'm here for it, right? Um, but the, the impulse by which he now wants the texts themselves to have a, f a, a historical frame, a historical and like documentary life within the story itself. Where are we getting the, this text that I'm writing? Who wrote it? Under what conditions was it written? And what was it doing? It's no longer just this sort of, it's what started off as a free flowing set of notes by him to keep the chronology straight and then became this kind of uh, overall sort of elvish summary, uh, you know, of the story year by year is now really becoming naturalized within the world of Middle-earth itself. Okay, no, no, this is going to be written, it's going to be the Grey Annals. It's going to be written by the Sindarin. And therefore, they're not going to tell all the Noldoran stories. And all of the stuff from the Annals of Valinor, because I was just following the chronology before, and so, of course, there was a bunch of, Den of, of the stuff about Denethor and Thingol, you know, the meanwhile in Middle-earth stuff, Right, that was uh, that was happening in the annals of Valinor back in 1937 as well. No, no, no. I'm going to take that stuff and I'm going to shift it. I'm going to put that all here in the Grey Annals because this is all Sindar all the time. Not to say that it's never going to say anything about somebody who's not a Sindar, right? But I'm going to invent. I'm talking. I'm going to invent a historical frame uh, for this. Again, this suggests to me a significant step forward in how he's thinking about this story. And you know what it sounds to me most like? What it reminds me of most? It reminds me most of a note on Shire Records. Um, that's what it reminds me of. <laughs> reminds me most of what I just wrote the first chapter of my book on. Um, when he comes at the end of The Lord of the Rings and situates the writing of the Lord of the Rings itself, the manuscript history, um, you know, the, 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 the history of the provenance of the Lord of the Rings 
manuscript and how it came down to him, the modern uh, translator and compiler. Um, he's in that he's in that mode, I think, when he's writing this here, and he wants to make just as he had tremendous fun making the writing of the book itself, of the Red Book, a part of the story. The last pages are for you, Sam. Right. Um, even the story of how um, Bilbo's corruption by the ring screwed up the first edition of The Hobbit because he lied in chapter 5. Right? He told the lying version of chapter 5. Um, all of the ways in which he has made the writing of the story itself a part of the story, now he is putting that impulse to work here. And again, it's not that this impulse is like totally unknown in the history of the Silmarillion materials. We saw, in a sense, he started there with the frame of the Book of Lost Tales, right? I, I, I want to have my human narrator who's going around and asking questions of all the elves, and I want to tell the story. You know, so that, that impulse, um, it's, a, it's a new impulse that he's just been developing in writing The Lord of the Rings, but it's also an old impulse, right? But it's an impulse that had gone away after the Book of Lost Tales. Um, we haven't seen it quite so much. There is some evidence that he's still thinking vaguely in those terms, in some ways, in like the 1937 material. Um, but I think that this change here shows that he's really sort of sharpening that um, in all of this. And yes, Feanor's Pizza, I agree with that. One of the things that this also suggests, so that's the significance of him giving it a frame, a consistent frame like this. But Feanaro, you are correct. Um, uh, by choosing the Sindar as uh, his um, as his frame, what he's doing, at least implicitly, is more world building. Um, Fanaro, as you say, he's setting the Sindar apart as a people. They're not just diet Calaquendi anymore. Yeah, yeah, which is a very Noldor Noldoran perspective, isn't it? Right. Um, yeah, we've we got implicitly or explicitly, we got almost all or indeed all of the early stuff from the point of view of the Noldor, right? I mean, it's been a Noldor in story from the beginning. Um, now, now he seems to be at least tentatively undertaking what is not just like a cute little frame that he's adding onto it, but potentially what is also a really new way of thinking through this stories. Let me tell this story. Now, when we put the annals next to the Quinta, we're not just getting two versions of the same story now in a slightly different format, which is kind of what it was before, right? No, now we're, you're going to hear you're going to hear from a different voice entirely, a totally different cultural perspective. How do the Sindar tell the story of the last four or five centuries of the first age? And that is a really interesting, a really cool project. Okay, guess what? Hey, let's start the Grey Annals. Okay, we'll do maybe one slide of the Grey Annals. Okay, here we go. Paragraph one. These are the Annals of Beleriand as they were made by the Sindar, the Grey Elves of Doriath, and the Havens, and enlarged from the records and memories of the remnant of the Noldor of Nargothrond and Gondolin at the mouths of Syrian, whence they were brought back into the west. Beleriand is the name of the country that lay upon either side of the great river Syrian ere the Elder Days were ended. This name it bears in the oldest records that survive, and it is here retained in that form, though, it is, though now it is called Beleriand. Really? The name signifies in the language of that land the country of Balar. For this name the Sindar gave to Ose, who, often, who came often to those coasts, and there befriended them. Okay, first paragraph first. So note that we've kind of hedged our bets here a little bit, right? He has explicitly made this... These are the annals as they were made by the Sindar, the Grey Elves of Doriath and the Havens. Right? Okay, so this is this is the Moraquendi point of view, clearly and explicitly, of the major events in Beleriand. But it's not going to be 100% purged of Noldoran stuff, right? Because, of course, 
the remnant of the Sindar and the remnant of the Noldor of Nargothrond and Gondolin all combined at the mouths of Syrian, right, with Eärendil and Elrond and right, everybody else there at the very end. And so during those days, the Annals of Beleriand would have been supplemented with material from the Noldor of Nargothrond and Gondolin. So that means that he doesn't have to say nothing about things that the Sindar wouldn't have, may have known little about, right? Because he can, they can recount things that they heard from the Noldor. So we can get some Noldor and stuff, but we're still getting it sort of filtered through the Sindar here. So that's interesting. Final interesting thing. In fact, one of the most mind-blowing things on this slide, actually. Whence they were brought back into the West. Wait, what? What is the manuscript provenance of the book that we're reading? So these annals were made by the Sindar, the Grails of Doriath and the Haven. So some was written in Doriath, probably. Some written by Cirdan's elves at the Havens, probably. The final version supplemented and revised and edited at the mouths of Syrian, you know, in the in the in the in the in the last days of the first age. Okay. Sure. And then what happened to it? Then it was taken into the West. How did we get it? Don't you wanna know? <laughs> How if the annals of Balerian were brought into the West, like Who's talking here? And to whom? Who's the intended audience of these annals? Are the annals of Balerion, therefore, are the, the gray annals that we're reading, is the intended purpose of the text in the minds of the authors and editors who originally compiled them, that is to say the Sindar, is this designed to be an account for the benefit of the elves of Amon and Toleresia? Hey, just wanted y'all to know, here's what really happened. Let me give you the real skinny about Beleriand. Is that their target audience? On the one hand, that seems kind of likely. That seems kind of likely, but, um, but it then raises the question, how did we get it? Alfwina, probably. Um, maybe this got, um, thrown in, you know, a, uh, a, uh, Alfwina arrived on a day they were doing a, an elf legend bundle, right? And so he got the Grey Annals at the same time that he got, like, the Book of Lost Tales or whatever, and he brought it back home. That's probably it. Anyway, but that, I think, is an interesting point. If the target audience for this is meant to be the elves of the West, fascinating. Exactly, Catriona. They were having a BOGO sale, uh, which was fortunate on the day that uh, that Alfwina um, showed up, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, were these all part of the whole Red Book compilation that Frodo and company compiled? Scott, I have to think so. I absolutely have to think so. Um I am very confident, very confident. You can't 100% prove it, I think, but I'm pretty confident that the Note on Shire Records, which was not published with the first edition of the Fellowship of the Ring, and is clearly written later, that Note on Shire Records was written after this, was written in, like, 1950. Um, and so, therefore when he writes his little, like, fantasy version of The Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion published together and bound in red leather in a single case, um, he'd already written this. Uh, so I, I think, yeah. And remember, this paragraph is one of those paragraphs that he's writing in fancy, in uh, fancy script, right? Um, in other words, he's preparing it essentially preparing it, basically preparing it for publication. Um, so, um, so yeah, yeah, I, I would guess, therefore, that the Grey Annals and the Annals of Amon both feature 
in the translations from the Elvish by BB. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And take a crack at the second paragraph. We get an alternate name. Now Beleriand is called Beleriand. All right. We learn where its name came from, which we weren't told before. Um, it's the country of Balar. Because that's what the Sindar call Ose. Ose, of course, is a Quenya name. The Sindar called him Balar. And therefore they called this whole land Balerian because he came off into these coasts and befriended them there. They, they, were, they were buddies with Balar, a.k.a. Ose, and so they named this country after him because they met him when they got to this country. Okay, fascinating. Now, I want to emphasize momentarily, because we'll come back to this at the beginning of class next time. Beleriand is the name of the country that lay upon either side of the great river Syrian. There are several references that are in the published Silmarillion, that made it into the published Silmarillion, which suggest what a very big deal the river Syrian is. Very big deal. Um, it's never really explained. We don't... We certainly don't get it in the sort of framing materials, right? Like, I mean, at the beginning, when he's explaining, like when we're getting like a Beleriand in its realms and, and um, you know, I don't, like... He never sits down when he's first describing Beleriand, you know, when we get the first discussion of Beleriand in the earlier chapters of the Silmarillion. We never really get Tolkien saying, there was the holy river Syrian, right, which is the center of all things in Beleriand. And, that, and like, here's why Syrian was so important. Here's the significance. Let me explain the significance of the river Syrian and why everything in the land about it is sort of defined by its proximity to the river Syrian. Right? We never get any explanation of that kind. All we get is later references, like in the Turin story, for instance, which, based on what Christopher has told us, we can probably guess came from this period, right? Uh, this period of writing. In that we, we get some later writings which are talking about, you know, the Olmo talking about how his power is removed from the River Syrian and all that stuff, right? Um, but again, that's not explained, really, at the beginning. And so to frame this, to say, like, from the beginning, well, from paragraph two, right, our first paragraph about Beleriand itself, to define the region of Beleriand, as the country that lay upon either side of the great river Syrian. Syrian is number one. The rest of the continent is just defined by its proximity to that river. No other river is mentioned. There are a bunch of other rivers in Syrian. Um, and this again is on this level a little bit misleading to me in the description of like a Beleriand in its realms, because we get the description of many rivers and, you know, how Gelion, when it finally reaches the sea, is like longer than Syrian and everything else, right? I get the impression that the, Syria, the river Syrian is the greatest river in Beleriand. That's clear. But there are other very important rivers, too. It's one of several. It's the biggest, it's the mightiest of many important rivers in Beleriand, is the impression I get uh, from, of Beleriand and its realms. Not that the entire, you know, landmass is basically just definable as the country that lay upon either side of the river Syrian, right? So there is something very, very big here. And yes, I'll say as Olmo's servant. Um, uh, yes, exactly. So all of this, um, all of this stuff, um, uh, the Syrian stuff, and the Balar stuff, the Ase stuff, seems to be sort of connected together. Um, I think there can't be any coincidence to the fact that the land which they've named after their new friend Balar um, is defined as 
the land that's near the great river Syrian, which is the river which Olmo speaks of as having his own power invested in it from one end to the next. Um, so yeah, that certainly seems important. Um, yeah, Dr. Benway, I think that's the first thing that we see here. That apparently it's what I think we're invited to conclude here is that the River Syrian is possibly more important to the Sindar than it was to the Noldor, right? And that we're getting this now from, since we're getting it from the Sindarin perspective, we're hearing this in a in a new way, right? Okay, um, well, can't say we didn't start the Grey Annals. We got through the first two paragraphs, so that was a lot uh, to accomplish. Next time, I it's hard for me to even guess, uh, you know, in trying to give you a reading assignment for next time. Um, uh, hang on. I don't want to go to the next slide yet. We're not going to be able to talk about that tonight. Okay. Um, so let's see. How far do we think is reasonable to expect that there's the vaguest hope that we might <laughs> we might get to? Because there's still a lot. Um, I'm going to try not to go too slowly. Tell you what. Why don't you read up to um, read up to page thirty six? It's ambitious, I know. Read up to page thirty six in the hardcover edition, um, that which is labeled Year Sixty, the Third Battle. Um, so right before Morgoth makes trial of his strength. So right before the Dagar Aglareb, the Dagor Aglareb, the glorious battle. We will, um, so we will cover the early days. We'll attempt to cover as much of the early days as we can. Page 36, that's what we're going to read up to. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put my bookmark right in there here. My lovely wooden bookmark that I got as a present. Thank you. Okay, um... Thanks, everybody, for joining me. Uh, we are now well and truly begun and immersed in the text here of the War of the Jewels, uh, going through the Grey Annals, looking forward to the Grey Annals, uh, and seeing what more we learn about the Sindar and everything as we move forward. Thanks, and I should see you guys again next Wednesday. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye now.